Hello, I'm Rob Hirschfeld, CEO and co-founder of RackN, and this is the fourth session of the Cloud 2030 Summit, where we talk about the pace of innovation, the acceleration that we keep seeing where things are constantly being turned over and brought in and new innovation. Um, in later 2030 discussions, we talked about the OPEX CAPEX component of this, which is fascinating um, and worth checking out that session also. This one, um, we really started struggling with you know, what does it mean to keep innovating this fast and how do we keep up and, and or is all that change good? Can, you know, what, what, what harm potentially are we, we inflicting as we look out into the future? And what benefits are we creating also? Uh, a very exciting session, enjoy it. We are very captivated by the pace of innovation and we, we have a huge need to move quickly and build things quickly, right? I mean, the, your comment about, hey, we built something really fast with OpenStack, um, in part because we separated out the teams and everybody was able to do their own thing. Um, one of the, my frustrations with OpenStack, and you were involved in this too, is there's no product, product management. There was minimal architectural coordination to build a product. Totally um, agree. From, from that perspective, but I don't, I think OpenStack was written by the architecture that um, the, the project architecture was very similar to what we see being writ large all over the place. Hey, I need, I need to do something. I'm not going to write it myself. I'm going to go use this SAS and that SAS and that SAS. And in the last section, we talked about, you know, a, a 10 year old tower PC that's running banking infrastructure. And while we're all looking at it horrified, there's a part of me that's like, hell yeah, they got, that's robust. If you had done that with a SaaS, there is no way in hell that your SaaS application would be 10, could, could run 10 years or even 10 months without, you know, some, some ability of, of risk on what the SaaS provider is going to do or how the SaaS provider is going to manage that service. I can't even get half of my apps to run on my old iPad. That's a year old. And, and so we've, we've really been captivated, Mike, to your point, and I love this, is go, 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 burn the bridges. Is that, is that 2030, what's that look like in 10 years? What does that mean, go, 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 burn the bridges? Um, this to me is a complaint I have about the Kubernetes community. Um, more, uh, I don't know if they're better, they're a little better now, but I would sit in on Kubernetes discussions um, and they would be like, well, if you're not doing it the way we think you should be doing it, you're wrong. Start, rewrite your app, start from scratch so, and, okay. and migrate, so, you know, migrate it to but, Kubernetes. But okay. Rob, why are, why are we giving that air? Why are, why are we giving that support and giving that air in terms of our time and conversation? Because I think it's representative, representative of and we've touched on this throughout the day, it's representative of a, a have to get it done mentality. And technology. And that the new thing is better than the, the old thing. I, I mean, do you not, do you not see that or? Nope, I don't. Cause okay. I, cause again, I go back, to, I go back to what's the value in doing so. Um, That's not how we run businesses. Yeah, right. I mean, we don't, and the, just because some new toy comes out, we don't burn everything to the ground and say, oh, VMs are bad. Right. Containers good. Right. I mean, it's, that's right. Well, I mean, there, like there are do. reasons, there are legitimate reasons why companies still run mainframe technology and mainframe technology. And some of these have been clients of mine and our current clients of mine. And you know what? It is the best technology on the planet for them to be running for that particular function. And so, you know, just because Kubernetes or containers or whatever the next thing that comes out, the next bright, shiny object that comes out uh, becomes the, the darling of the technology industry doesn't mean that we should be running to it. I mean, go back to what we were talking about right before the break. This is kind of what gets us into trouble that we run from one thing to the next without thinking about the value that it provides. I mean, to a line of business person, they don't give a rat's ass what technology is underpinning. They don't care if it's containers or Kubernetes or ser serverless or cloud or edge. They don't care. What they care about is what is the value that they're going to provide. Yep. So and and I, to, 
to bring it below beneath that level of Tim. And I think I love having these conversations with Tim because Tim brings the right perspective from how this stuff gets consumed. And I try and balance how it gets managed. My problem is with Kubernetes isn't that it's the next shiny thing. It is my problem with Kubernetes. It's the next shiny thing that's going to add to the complexity so that I can have a seamless relationship with Tim. If I'm going to bring Kubernetes into my environment, I have to give up something else. Like I, I've gotten to the point I can't I can't keep maintaining everything. I, I have the mainframe. It has to be there. I have the client server stuff. It has to be there. I have the cloud apps I just built a couple of years ago. It has to be there. And I have Kubernetes. But my my when I go talk to Tim, he's not giving me more budget to manage more things because there's not more value. So unless I can show that there's more, even if I could show more value, I don't want to manage more stuff. So my argument with Kubernetes has always been, you know what? Yeah, it's great, but so is the old stuff. And how am I going to manage it? If you guys are not coming to me, and I think this, Rob, is to your point. If the community isn't coming to me and showing me how I can integrate it, if they're not calling me a third, a third grader, which they did, if they're not calling me a third grader and showing me how I can integrate Kubernetes operationally with my mainframe, I'm not interested from a technology from a technologist perspective. Well, well, and Keith, I'll take it a step further and say, so let's you and I kind of banter on this for a minute, because I think it would be I think it would help others through the process, which is I would come back to you and say, why? Why do you want to use Kubernetes? So if I'm the CEO of the company, why are you so why are you so gung-ho on this particular technology? Why? What, what is it that our current technology won't be able to suffice? Is this really where we need to take the hill? Is this the most important thing that's going to help us achieve those business objectives? And if you can't do two things, I don't want to put air into it. I don't want to put value into it, which is you have to address, number one, how this is going to address one of our core business objectives that we have identified for the company. And number two is you have to have clear line of sight as to how that particular technology is going to address one of those core business objectives. Mm -hmm. So just saying that, hey, it's gonna make us go faster or make us go, be more agile, that that's gonna somehow get my attention, isn't. And I think this is part of the problem that people have. I relinquish my time. <laughs> and, I, and Tim, you're, you're arguing to the, you're, you're, you're preaching to the choir in, in the form of me. I can't. I know I am. And that's the tough one for me. Is I that, can do it with you. Yeah, I, I love Kubernetes from like a technologist perspective. I'll build a Kubernetes lab and break it and do it all. I would never want to run this in production because it doesn't, in my mind, bring enough value for the difficult conversations I have to go back and have with Tim when it breaks. And then he says, wait, I thought you said this was the solution. This looks like an awful lot more of just IT. So to And that's and that's it, right, Keith, is that, you know, I think people don't appreciate the fact that adding more into the IT paradigm makes it more complicated, not simpler. And so again, you can't just look at any one given technology. You have to look at the bigger picture. And this is where, you know, people get so laser focused, so myopically focused in these technology veins without looking at, you know, the broader context. And so I'm just suggesting, you know, once I get off my soapbox, I'm just suggesting that maybe open the aperture a little bit and look at how this fits into the bigger picture. Understand how this is really going to make a core business difference don't just look at it for technology sake. So is the th is the theme of that we're that we're shooting for for twenty you know for twenty thirty as an as an industry or as a society simplicity? I don't think we're going to find that for a long time. <laughs> yes, I think well, this is gone. this is this is why I wanted to combine the complexity topic and this topic together. I think that everything I've seen in our discussion so far is that 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 ship has sailed. We are we are not we we are not we are not going to build less complex systems. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not a fan mean, of this idea that you can you hey, can Keith, all, oh, go ahead. 
I'm so, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but Rob, can yeah. can you maybe just explain what you mean that we're not going to build more simple simplistic systems? Are you implying that we are going to build more complicated systems? I then? I think yeah, that the trend line shows that we're going to have increasing complexity over the next ten years, not not simpler. Now it might be simpler Rob? if you're a developer and I'm trying to just bundle things in container, but I think the the we're I think we're seeing Systems that are more interconnected, have more hidden, more dependencies, are built on taller stacks, and have more heterogeneity. Um, but, yes, Rob, but, that's my contention. Rob, Can I put my hand up for a second? <laughs> uh, I, I was just going to say that I, I think I think the common thing that we're talking about, but not actually explicitly saying, is operations is really hard, um, and um, it's it's fundamentally undervalued in a lot of organizations. They don't quite understand what it takes to run their own existing organization, much less move to a new, new technology, what the, the price of, uh, or the cost of retraining highly skilled specialized people to, to learn something new, even if it's just changing from Cisco to, uh, or actually a good example is from Nortel to Cisco um, or any other technology, it's, it's painful, it's difficult. Um, and uh, fundamentally, a lot of organizations don't understand um, how difficult operations is. I, I see it constantly. I don't want to do operations, but I always come back to it because that's fundamentally what the problem is. Otherwise, everybody would be using Kubernetes and Isto and all these other cool tools that are coming online. But it's really painful because these things don't work exactly like we wish they did. And yep. to integrate it with our existing systems, nobody has a greenfield uh, organization where they can just restart everything from scratch and then it magically works. It, you know, I had a call, with, and let me, uh, okay. had a call with the CTO of New York Times and they built their crossword puzzles on a serverless platform, one of the biggest revenue makers for the New York Times. And he talked about the transition from uh, his for his ops team. And the end point, he was like, yes, writing the application was easier operating the application wasn't any easier. So, and it, to, to some extent, it became more complex. So yes, we reduced the friction on the developer side, but we, uh, he in increased friction on the ops side because one, you lose visibility, all the classic problems you have with cloud and SaaS services, and you cobble them together to create an actual, to actual value. The ops equation gets, squeeze, you're squeezing the balloon. Have we gotten to have we gotten to a point, you know, looking at what uh, Steve O'Grady at Red Monk uh, wrote in his book where developers are the new kingmakers? Are we at an inflection point going towards 2030 where now ops are the new kingmakers? Well, well, I mean, it goes. Go ahead, Keith. I think you were going to say something. I, I, no, there was it wasn't. Oh, there was a. Uh, I'm oh, sorry. I, I was I was just going to add. There there used to be, but this that ship has sailed. That used to be a hard demark between the architects, the people who were actually architecting the application itself, and the ops. But you know, over time, over the last decade and a half, we realized that scalable applications are only scalable if operation is a first class citizen. Um, so you, you know, even if, if you're growing up. Um, and you're looking at your own career, uh, you cannot ignore ops. Um, if it's a scalable application, right? Um, it's, it's not only it's a first class citizen operation and how you do logging, monitoring, observability, it's, it's a first class citizen of the application itself. Uh, if you can't operationalize and manage the application, it is lousy architecture. Um, yeah. Isn't yeah, I was going to add on top of what Sean was saying, I think, Rob, we've had this discussion many times. And sometimes I feel like it's it's not a good conversation, but it's reality, I think, is that cloud has made people stupid. Let's just be real. Um, and, I, and I don't mean that as meaning <laughs> Rob's turn. Wait, to say Larry, you know, <laughs> some of us already started out pretty dumb. You, so. waited, you waited until I was drinking to say that. I, I, I saw your timing. <laughs> but I mean, what I mean by that, right, is that we've taken these, you know, Kubernetes, for example. Let's not go down this anymore. And, and I made the joke to Sean about, you know, being brave to stand up from OpenStack. Probably all of us on this call 
have been down that route of OpenStack. We've been down the road, road for Kubernetes for years. I'm not talking about just now. We've experienced the opera operational sustainability of those solutions. It's not realistic unless you outsource it. You cannot afford the people to have on staff to maintain it long-term. And what I meant by the comment of making pe people stupid is we've relied on the more we consume cloud and offloading the operational, being able to understand how our applications work from a holistic perspective and just consuming those resources to stitch them together with APIs and all the different things. We don't know what the hell to do when things break. Is it right? necessarily bad though? No, it's not bad. It's not bad. Uh, it's horrible. But it's, but it's, <laughs> but it is bad because it's not, it's not sustainable. Right. Well, well, can I can I put my hand up again, real quick? Yeah. So, OpenStack fundamentally started off um, just to kind of go back to that well um, as a collection of projects. Um, they weren't products, and I think a lot of people fundamentally didn't understand that's what we were doing. Um, and so, a bunch of consumers uh, of technology started trying to consume OpenStack projects assuming that they were products and they were finished and ready to go and hell no, they weren't. They're were right. <laughs> full of tons of bugs. Yep. Um, and so um, fundamental things like um, inspection of um, uh, API communication to diagnose a problem just didn't exist or the skills to even analyze the data just, you know, weren't there. So um, there was only a few companies. My, the company I was at at the time, Yahoo were one of the few because we helped write some of this stuff. So we were building internal products based on the projects. Um, and it worked for us because it was easier than going into MOUs with a few partners like VMware and others to build separate products, Nisera being one of them um, as well. But so you, um, so you also designed to the, to the capabilities of the platform. Right. I mean, I, right. For my, my frustration with, with this and what we're talking about is we have given up, and this is my whole, my whole point from a 2030 perspective, because I think this trend line continues and I find it frustrating. We have given up thinking that products, that people should build products. We are, we are saying, you know what? It's okay that the only people who can run Kubernetes are hyperscale clouds. And if you wanna do it on your own, you better have a whole bunch of capabilities and expertise and you community contributors and things like this. So Kubernetes isn't a product. It's not designed to be a product. We don't expect it to be a product. We expect it to be somebody else to run it for us. So Rob, and, you're, you're, mm -hmm. you're hitting one of the key attributes of what yeah. I've been preaching over the past few years. And this goes back to OpenStack. When I first experienced OpenStack and I, I'm like, well, hold on. This is not something for, for the enterprise. Tim can speak to this to some degree. I cannot hire and retain the talent needed to. I can deploy OpenStack and I can build some amazing applications on top of it. Sure. Folks have shown that. But I can't maintain that talent long term because the, the, the economics from a engineer perspective does not make sense. I just saw a blog post the other day or posting job posting the other day for $350,000 a year for SRE. I can't afford that. I don't care who I am. I can't afford that at scale. So when Kubernetes came out uh, to the enterprise, I'm looking at, a, at another system that requires the same economies of scale. If I'm not building a product that's earning money out of this, I can't put my I don't see a, a, a price model or operating model where I can take Kubernetes and replace my IT infrastructure that's running SAP, blah, 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 a bunch of undifferentiated applications that don't earn me money on top of Kubernetes. So if I'm going to have both environments, why not just go to the cloud providers who are professionals at doing this? Well, so to, to add a little bit, um, it's not necessarily a bad thing uh, where you can't afford in-house talent to manage your Kubernetes cluster. If you can't cost justify it, uh, it generally tracks with what your compute use case is as well, right? So, so, and because of that, it 
it isn't bad if you look at you know what an SRE for a Kubernetes cluster costs nowadays. Um, good, perhaps you don't have a valid business use case because your application sprawl isn't that much. You don't have that big of a consumer base. You're not bringing that much money in. So generally, large scale infrastructure that requires cluster management, cluster orchestration, that's where Kubernetes fits in. Now, I happen to be a champion of Kubernetes, but there are also a lot of these, you know, false strawmans that get brought up that, you know, if I can't, uh, and this is not to, you know, specify what I just heard on the chat so far, but um, nobody is really talking about integrating a mainframe and having that running with Kubernetes. I mean, they can run side by side, uh, you know, where, there are use cases for running mainframes and this is exactly what they're for, right? If you really need deeply coupled storage with logic, right? That's a classic canonical use case for massive, massive data processing. Uh, yeah, run mainframes, uh, that's fine. But, you know, this deeply coupled storage and compute, this is not where you actually run up the early, early use cases of Kubernetes, right? They, they you run that when you really need ephemeral applications, decoupled storage and compute. Um, those are the use cases for it. So, you know, if, if somebody says, hey, you know, I have mainframes, my entire data center is full of mainframes. I want to bring Kubernetes inside. You're like, well, that's not even wrong. It's, it's a non-starter. Uh, what are the use cases? You know, what is the application supposed to do? Um, if somebody starts saying, I want to migrate my mainframes onto Kubernetes, you go, you're insane. Um, that's it. You know, you just walk out the door. I don't want to be involved with you guys. So oh, I love the, that perspective. And there's a couple of things in that that I want to make sure that we unpack. Right. One is, and especially we look towards the eye of 2030. I have a finite number of smart people. And typically the people that can deploy and manage Kubernetes have similar aptitudes to the people that can build other types of applications and infrastructures. As I look, as I took the look at the eye of the 2030, I don't have anything against Kubernetes. I have uh, I, I have finite resources of smart people. So do I want my smart people building Kubernetes, building and managed Kubernetes clusters or solving a different problem in my enterprise? If you're if if the argument is that, you know, I can build ephemeral applications, blah, blah, blah. I can do that in public cloud with existing services. Make the argument to me who has to deploy these these very precious solutions, not money, but people that I just can't easily replicate. Why should I have my smartest people working on Kubernetes? Not, not necessarily. So this is this is where budget and allocation matters, right? You have an application budget, and if you want to stand up a new application completely decoupled, disjoint from the apps that are running on your mainframes, then you say, well, do I have an app budget? Then you have a conversation. Do I want to run it in the public cloud versus do I want to manage my Kubernetes cluster in-house? Uh, then there are certain use cases where you can't run certain Kubernetes clusters in the public cloud. I am working on one because we happen to have bespoke hardware that is not running on the cloud. These are cognitive radios, right? I'm, I'm running a 5G lab, essentially, a massive scale 5G lab. Um, it can't run, but I actually need the same functionality that Kubernetes provides. So yes, uh, I have to run Kubernetes. Uh, you pretty soon you become an expert and you start running it. It depends, what is it for? When you start talking about Kubernetes at the edge, like a lot of the infrastructure at the edge does not, is not built for cluster management existing right now, right? Yes, you, more and more you can start re-architecting, rebuilding infrastructure at the edge for Kubernetes as well. But what are the use cases for it? Um, to me, Kubernetes at the edge makes perfect sense because most of the applications at the edge, they're not doing batch data processing, mainframe applications. They are not meant for the edge. Their Kubernetes makes perfect sense to me. Um, oh, and I, I don't think we're disagreeing. I think the, the point is, is that uh, as we've gotten into a method where VMware is calling, the CEO of VMware is calling Kubernetes the dial tone of the internet, that's hyperbole. That's like, what? No. Kubernetes isn't the dial tone of the internet. Well, so you have to understand why VMware is doing that, right? VMware, their bread and butter is not just a VM, right? When enterprises, they're vSphere vSphere licenses, they're buying it for vCenter, right? They're buying it that, okay, now you have this, you know, abstraction of abstracting out the hardware, running it on VMs that can actually essentially, you know, uh, 
take and splice out the hardware. That's not what the enterprises are buying, right? If that's what it was, they could just buy Parallax or something, right? Any other virtualization technology. Enterprises were buying VMware pre Tanzu Tanzu. They were buying it for vCenter. How do I manage? Or what the other workloads are, right? But, Snapshotting, migration between but it, but VMs, it's, right? But These it's not even but enterprise it's not even that. And, and, and but hold on, I want I want to go back. I'm sorry, but you're 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 close to the point that I think is important. VMware spent a lot of money making a product that was enterprise ready and solving. Yep. A, you know, and 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 my my point here is that that is not a priority for Kubernetes. Maybe VMware can make it a priority by embedding it into their product, but Kubernetes doesn't care. And what I keep hearing from in the, in this discussion is we don't care that we've gotten to a point where we're like, oh yeah, there's a ton of sharp edges with Kubernetes. I'm not upset that Kubernetes is not a product because I'm just, I'm going to just keep going to somebody else to run it for me. And that is my new MO. That is my new business model. I've, I've decided I'm giving up that expertise. I'm giving up the means of production for it. And it yeah, and then, so Rob, to, to pick it up, to, to expand beyond Kubernetes as we talk about 2030, because I don't know what the next yeah. Kubernetes is going to be in 2030. And there will be one. And, and there will be one. I'm making the argument. Threat, threat management. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I don't want to run it. I don't want the skill set in the house, in house to run it. You can say vCenter. I don't want the skill set in house to run vCenter. I want somebody else to do it if possible. If it's not yeah. possible, then yes, I'll do it. But otherwise, I don't. I, v so why, why, why are we I content do with, with people writing writing these pro, these the software that is not actually operable enough that you could run it? Well, uh, so, so I guess you know to take I, off what what Keith is saying, I'll put it in a, a different way because I think we're we're of the same ilk in this, which is just because I can do it doesn't mean I should do it. And just because I used to do it in the past doesn't mean I should do it in the future. And, and this gets back to something that, again, you could look at it at, at a very macro level or a very micro level. But just because you were doing something in a specific way in the past, you know, things are changing over time. And I don't, to Keith's point, I agree. I would not want my staff today working on the depths unless, unless there were something that were highly differentiating for me from a business standpoint that directly connected to my IP. If it so, weren't for that, then why am I, why am I trying to build expertise in this? And so, this is so where is Keith, Keith got into uh, a spirited debate about. In the perfect world, man, a managed service provider will come in and give me APIs and capabilities to be able to offload that stuff. And it hasn't happened. That's what I, in a perfect world, that's what I want. But every time I've personally gotten involved with managed service provider that has said that they can abstract this cloud-like capability for me, it has turned out horribly. So that, that I, I'm just frustrated on where the technology is at versus where service providers are at and making consumption of this technology seamless. Well, it's worse than that, Keith. I mean, if we talk about, the, sorry, Sean, I, I know oh, I catch you up twice. Let me sorry. just add this one point and then relinquish the gavel, which is that I, I think that we have to be very cautious about looking at the vendor side of this equation, because I do believe that across the board, vendors are misled. They're, they're relying on a lot of history and history, and it goes back to, to what I was saying, and, and a good friend of mine who's a CIO, has been a CIO for a number of wars, she said, you know, what got us here won't get us there. And unfortunately, they're using the same playbook over and over again. And, you know, I know Keith and I specifically have been having this conversation with a number of enterprise vendors, and they're still not getting it. We have to be careful about that. I think that's an opportunity for us to change as part of this. Yeah, you're, you're, I, I've, Keith Townsend, you and I, I think we just had a recent conversation too. Probably, Tim, you were probably part of that too. The, the vendors are, um, <laughs> are, are a big part of the problem, right? They're not moving the needle, is, in my opinion. I will, uh, vendors I will, are always the problem. I'll that, <laughs> that, that argument as well. I mean, yeah. we, 
they we we see in my business we see vendors all the time who are essentially addicted to their because they live quarter to quarter they're addicted to their current revenue streams and the idea that they want to disrupt their own revenue revenue stream by doing something different is you know it's frankly terrifying yeah. right and it's just it's sort of it's sort of because they're because they are unwilling and unable to plan plan for more than a quarter or certainly more than a year in advance um you know they, they're, they're sort of stuck in this never innovate cycle hope this uh, pace of innovation session was interesting for you we are going to be turning our attention to the consequence how this scales and what happens as we get bigger and bigger um because that's the consequence of of growing these systems into every corner of our lives so check out the next session in the Cloud 2030 uh, Summit.